I'm particularly delighted to welcome our speaker tonight, Nebras al Kazimi, who had an impact on me for years before I met him because I was one of the devoted followers of his blog, Talisman Gate, about which I'll tell you more in a moment. Uh, he directed research, rather, he directed the Research Bureau of the Iraqi National Congress in Washington, D.C. <laughs> And Baghdad, he was a pro bono advisor for the Higher National Commission for Debathification. He's been a visiting fellow at the Hudson Institute. He's written weekly columns for the New York Sun, a monthly column for Prospect Magazine in Great Britain. He's appeared in Newsweek, The New Republic, and many notable publications. He's the author of a monograph, Syria Through Jihadist Eyes a perfect enemy. He's also a member of the Atlantic Council's 2016 Iraq Task Force. The blog to which I referred, the Talisman Gate, um, analyzed events in Baghdad and Iraq from Baghdad or here or other locations. And I found it after my brief experience in Baghdad and returning here, one of the most uh, powerfully analytic uh, sources of insight and writing that I came across. And so I was an avid follower of it, and I'm delighted to tell you that uh, Nebras al Kazimi has resumed writing now from Talisman Gate again. Is that correct? And we're delighted to have him here tonight to address the extremely important subject of how jihadists weaponize Islamic history and how to de-weaponize it. Please join me in welcoming Nebras al Kazimi. Hello. Thank you to the Smithster Institute for hosting me tonight, and thank you for coming out. Thank you, Bob, for this introduction. And um, uh, I, hope, uh, I hope I will present my case of why I believe the extremists, both Sunni and Shia in the Middle East, are weaponizing history, and how I see ways of challenging them on that terrain and inserting doubt into their narrative. So their use of history is nothing new or unique. Identities, whether they're sectarian, religious, or ethnic, uh, draw upon history in order to propel and propagate and legitimize uh, these identities, political parties, political ideologies. In the Middle East, uh, in the 20th uh, century, we saw many examples of that. Uh, Arab nationalism drew upon uh, the glories of uh, Arab civilization um, as an impetus for the rebirth of the Arab nation. You had Turkish na nationalism that began to some extent in the late 19th century, but really took shape in the 20th century, which uh, you know the, the common story, the common remembered history of how they came from Central Asia and conquered lands and created empires. The Shah of Iran uh, borrowed heavily from the glory and splendor of Persian civilization to add pomp and regality to his own dynasty and reign. And in the case of Iraq, you had Saddam Hussein not only uh, drawing upon Arab nationalism, but he took a specific, uh, a specific case from that to legitimize his war against Iran. Uh, so he called the Iran-Iraq War the Second Qadisiyah, which is a reference to the first battle of Qadisiyah when the conquering uh, Muslim armies uh, conquered Mesopotamia and took it away from the Sassanid Empire, the Persian Empire at the time. Not only that, he also drew upon the glory of Babylon. He likened himself to a modern day Nebuchadnezzar. He rebuilt the city of Babylon, and much like the original Nebuchadnezzar, Saddam inserted his name into the brickwork. So, you know, history confers legitimacy and 
infers destiny in, in this respect. Lots of people do it. So another way of using history is to, so if the first section is defining who we are, there, there's a use of history to define the other, the enemy, the reasons why we have that enemy. Uh, and in many cases uh, of the examples cited here and how the jihadists and other extremists are using history now, they find a number of dots, they connect these dots, and they extrapolate a conspiracy. Again, nothing new here. But what's, uh, what I feel is different about how the extremists today in the Middle East are using history, they're using it as a blueprint uh, of action. They go back to early Islam about six decades of the, the beginning of Islam, and they draw uh, precedent from that to infer or to instruct policy. So it's not just why it went wrong, uh, their citation of history and historical events, but it's also how are we going to get it right. Let's take, I'm going to give a lot of examples, and if you bear with me, somehow all these examples will have a method to them towards the end. So if we take the, the case of the Islamic State, something I want to note before I get into this is that the Islamic State sees itself as a 10-year venture, that they've been around for 10 years. So it's not just the declaration of the caliphate in September 2014, or before that, uh, ISIS, uh, the Islamic State uh, in Iraq and Syria, they go back, their sense of their story is that they go back to October 2006 when they proclaimed the Islamic State in Iraq. So we have our current, current caliph, uh, Abu Bakr, Bakr al-Baghdadi, but we have his predecessor, Abu Umar al-Baghdadi, and I'll be making sev several references to Abu Umar. So October 2006, they proclaim their new state. A few months after that, in January 2007, they issue a book. They publish a book. The book is called Informing the People uh, About the Birth of the State of Islam. And you know, they realize that what they're doing is something very bold. And they realize that what they have enacted is going to focus the hostility of a variety of, of forces against them, not just the enemy, the, the Americans or the Shia or others, but also their ideolo ideological uh, cousins like uh, other jihadists, other Salafists. Because the argument that these other uh, um, uh, jihadists might make is that the conditions are not right. What are you doing? This is, this is a big step <laughs> declaring an Islamic State because it's understood that this would be the attempt, attempted caliphate or resurrecting the caliphate. And we're not ready for this. Uh, we, don't have, uh, we, we don't have territory. We don't have consensus about how to pick a new caliph. We don't have any of this ready. No, the jihadists of the Islamic State say in this book, no, let us turn to history and look at precedent. When Muhammad began wielding authority in Medina, his territory was less than the territory that we are controlling at the time in Ramadi or in Ambar. And what we are seeking to do here with this Islamic State is just follow the, the, what Muhammad began in Medina. We're just following the steps that he took. So, Muhammad goes to Medina from Mecca. He draws his followers, his supporters to that new community. <coughs> and in that new community, he begins to exercise authority. And there are lots of challenges. He doesn't control the whole town. There are important Jewish tribes around that um, are armed, that have uh, a significant economic uh, presence, uh, that don't follow him. And he has to manage day-to-day -day affairs. He has to manage these relationships with these neutral tribes at the time. He has to wage war against his enemies or defend himself and his community against enemies. So he was facing a lot of setbacks. Now this, this issue of setbacks uh, is again a precedent that the jihadists cite, that when we have a setback, it's also a setback like 
a setback that Muhammad had faced. Uh, so their argument is that Muhammad didn't wait for the conditions to be optimal. He just went ahead and started because he's compelled to start and there's legitimacy in, in starting and this is what we're doing. We're starting but we're also not improvising. This is not off the top of our heads. We're following his steps, the steps that he took. And they always remind their uh, constituency uh, and the people who argue with them that even in the bleakest of times, the Prophet Muhammad foresaw that his community, his fledgling community, would bring down great empires like the empires of Byzantine, Byzantium or Persia. So, uh, again, what they're doing here, elements of it is not new. Going back to the basics, the idea of going back to the basics has a rich, rich tradition uh, in, in Islamic thought. You had uh, a 13th, 14th century uh, Muslim cleric, Ibn Taymiyyah, who counseled that we need to go back to the basics. He was writing at the time after the Mongol invasions, after Islam seemed to be wilting and withering. Um, uh, he inspired many movements, uh, including the Wahhabi movement of the late uh, or mid uh, to late uh, 18th uh, century uh, that also went back to the basics and they tried to put it, put it to, to, to action of reclaiming or um, uh, uh, resurrecting that vigor, that vitality of the faith by going back to the basics. But the jihadists, I would contend, are even more ambitious. They're inspired by Ibn Taymiyyah, they're inspired by the Wahhabis, but in their reliance on precedent in history, they've gone more ambitious because they went ahead and chose a caliph. And again, the way they chose a caliph uh, they went back to the precedent of how the first four caliphs were chosen in Islam. It's an ad hoc process. It was a messy process, lots of political dispute, um, lots of political factionalism. That's why we have Sunnis and Shiites today. Uh, so, but they go, they find something that works for them. And the, the, the elastic nature of history is that they can stretch it to fit their circumstances and make their case, their argument. And they made the case at the time that when they picked the predecessor of Abu Bakr, Abu Umar, uh, we, we did this and that and this, and it's according to what's had been done before. So that's, that's how we establish litig the legitimacy. So in this sense, history books are recipe, recipe books. They're, they're, they, they believe they can go back, follow a certain formula, and this formula, if enacted today, if fall today with some tweaking, then they will reclaim that greatness of Islam, the venture of Islam. Now, why, why do they use this? Because it works. And the question is, why does it work? Why does it work with their target audiences? So there's, in the Middle East, there's a received history. There's, a, there's a, you know, a form of history that is present in people's minds. It's mentally available about early Islam, what it looked like, what happened, uh, what were the issues. Uh, it's, this is taught in school books, in curricula. It's, uh, they, people hear it from the pulpit of mosques. People uh, watch it in, in media and TV series and movies. It's a popularized airbrush version of history. And this popular, uh, popularized version of history that, uh, uh, that many people grow up with is the foundation that the jihadists stand on as they cite precedent and make their case. Uh, let me give an example. So Abu Mus'ab al-Zarqawi, who is the founding father of this particular strain of uh, jihadism that gave us the Islamic State, <coughs> He goes, he's in Iraq in 2003. He looks at the situation. He sees uh, uh, the stirrings of sectarian antipathy between Sunnis and Shiites. He sees that and he says, this is, this is useful. I can use this. This is a fast burning fuel that will mobilize and motivate people to come to our cause. Abu Musab al-Zarqawi did not have to begin from scratch. 
there were um, centuries of this uh, had been going on, but more recently, in the last uh, three decades, uh, we had uh, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi benefited from a sustained campaign uh, um, that promoted sectarianism or anti-Shiism in the Middle East, in a lot of these societies in the Middle East. And th the reason for that, or what, what sparked it, was the 1979 revolution in Iran by Ayatollah Khomeini. So you had Khomeini's enemies, or uh, people who perceived themselves to be enemies of Khomeini, like Saddam Hussein, like the Saudis, they bankrolled a massive campaign that revisits earlier anti-Shiism uh, and propagates it. And they saturated the airwaves, they filled out uh, bookshelves, um, and it was, it was there. Um, and you know, it, it had certain elements, for example, uh, one, one myth that is propagated is that Shiism all started because of a Jew called Ibn Sabah. He basically invented Shiism. <laughs> and and that's, that's in white currency in people's heads. You know, that, after you, you launch such a campaign, it's going, to be, it's going to rankle somewhere in their people's brains. And they borrowed also from European anti-Semitism, okay, uh, um, the motifs. For example, in the late 90s, we had a book emerge called The Protocols of the Elders of Qum, Qum being the main Shia seminary in, in Iran. Uh, so Zarqawi arrives at the scene in 2003. He sees a canvas that has been primed for, for his new campaign to, to remind the Sunnis of Iraq about the perfidy and treachery of the Shia that the Shia uh, were invented in order to subvert the faith and that they are an existential threat to Islam. Uh, they are the internal enemy. And then he goes back to history and finds a very neat precedent that he can cite. He finds a character called Ibn al-Alqami. Who is Ibn al-Alqami? Ibn al-Alqami was the last vizier under the Abbasid court uh, before the Mongols sacked Baghdad in 1258. He was a Shia. The Abbasid court was Sunni. Somebody might say that's pretty progressive. A Sunni court uh, would have an Abbasid, uh, would have a, a vizier who is a Shia. But that, that, that goes out of the window. Zarqaw is not interested in that. He wants a poster boy uh, to blame, a scapegoat, to blame why the, the, uh, the mighty Abbasid empire uh, fell apart or why Baghdad fell to the Mongols. And as far as he's concerned, Ibn Alqami in that position conspired to weaken the Abbasid uh, Empire and basically handed over Baghdad on a silver platter to the Mongols. Uh, and of course, he connects it to the present in 2003, uh, actually this particular speech is in 2005, and he says, now these modern Shiites that we're dealing with, they're the grandchildren of Ibn Alqami. So it's, it's neat, it's succinct, it's, it's clear. And again, it's building on, on foundation. Now, I think an important element of, of why, why this resonates easily amongst the target audience is, is spectacle. I'll, I'll cite one, one example about uh, spectacle as an introduction to this topic. So again, Abu Umar al-Baghdadi, the first proto-caliph of the Islamic State. Today we have uh, his successor, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. But Abu Umar al-Baghdadi, uh, in his third speech, which was in March 2007, he comes out and says, you know what? These Christians uh, uh, are, are causing problems for Islam. They're enabling the West uh, to undermine Islam, to fight Islam. And I, the Prince of the Faithful, in the 21st century, I am going to annul the Pact of Umar. Pact of Umar back in the 7th century. Umar, the second caliph of Islam. A proper caliph. Depends on opinion. Uh, but but that, that's very bold. It's uh, the audacity that somebody says, 
I am annulling that pact because, again, the Christians have not kept up their end of the bargain. Now, what, what does that do? It's, 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 it's that confidence, it's that uh, assuredness that I am so legitimate in my position as a caliph or a proto-caliph and I can go ahead and do something as dramatic as annulling that pact. So, spectacle. Let's, as I said, let's dwell on this, on this issue of spectacle, how, how history has been dramatized in the popular imagination of the Middle East. And I want to talk about a personal, uh, my own example here. So, uh, there's a movie, or there was a movie, called The Message. It was produced in, uh, or released in 1976. There was a Syrian director. It was backed by Libyan money. Uh, it had two versions, one in Arabic and one in English, separate versions. The English version, uh, um, uh, Anthony Quinn played a leading uh, role in that one. Uh, and in many places in the Middle East, in places like Iraq and Syria, at uh, every religious uh, occasion, Eid or Ramadan or the, the Prophet's birthday, they show this movie. And growing up in the Middle East, um, I was b born the year it was produced. I think I've seen this movie something like 20 times. <laughs> all right? And for the simple fact that it's, it was on TV. Not only that, it, it's compelling. It's, it's, it's epic. It's very well made. Uh, the music is exhilarating. I think the score was nominated for an Academy Award, and it lost to Star Wars that year. Yeah. And I, I catch myself when I, you know, I'm reading these, you know, heavy scholastic books about early Islam, about the caliphs and these stories and history, and you know, I visualize what I'm reading from scenes. Uh, that I've derived from the movie. How people are dressed, the colors, the shape of the buildings, uh, um, uh, how people wear their hair. The, you know, early Islam, to me, is, has been very influ influenced by this movie. Now, just a, a side note, this movie was also one of the causes of grievance for uh, what I believe was the first terrorist or Islamic uh, terrorist act in Washington, D.C. In 1977, something called the Hanafi Siege, a splinter group from the Nation of Islam uh, took over three buildings in Washington, D.C. I think they left two people dead. Uh, and one of their grievances was this movie was being shown in Washington, D.C. Salafists generally don't like this movie because they feel it's too sympathetic to the Shia version of history. Um, and they find other inaccuracies and inconsistencies with it. So it's controversial, but it's very influential. Very influential. Now, fast forward to what we're doing here, and what, uh, what, the, uh, what we're looking at here, how jihadists use history. So the jihadists also dramatized history to make it more easily approachable and to allow it to resonate better with their target audiences. For example, their flag. Their flag, I look at it, you know, the archaic font, that seal that they have, the black color. To me, it just looks authentic. It looks like something that the art department that uh, was behind that movie, they, they'd come up with this flag. It looks as if it would belong in, in that movie, The Message. Of course, the jihadists claim that this is the banner of Muhammad, Rayat al uqab and uh, they're fighting, you know, again, drawing legitimacy from fighting under the banner of the Prophet. When they did their victory parade in Mosul, the parade was, uh, of course, lots of pickups with, uh, with uh, machine guns and tanks, and, but it was preceded by a number of fighters on horseback just the way they're dressed and how they're riding their horses. Again, it, it evokes scenes from uh, what, what I'd, I'd imagine, I think other people would imagine early Islam would have looked like, or how Muhammad entered Medina, Medina, uh, Mecca victorious. The, that, that image of the caliph, the, this current caliph, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, in his only televised speech so far, ascending the pulpit slowly in the mosque in Mosul, 
mm -hmm. all right? What he's wearing and how he turns and his gestures and how he's <coughs> speaking. Again, very dramatized, but it's also, it's evoking what people would imagine early Islam would look like. So, another thing, uh, another example, sorry for all these examples, but uh, some of them uh, will be useful later. Uh, so, Abu Umar al-Baghdadi, uh, I'm sorry to confuse people, juxtaposing between Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi and Abu Umar al-Baghdadi, but Abu Umar al-Baghdadi in November 2007 in his 13th speech, so this was the occasion of the U.S. elections. Uh, it's uh, clear from the uh, from from how the speech is presented that Abu Umar al-Baghdadi already knew that President Obama had been elected. He addresses his speech. Uh, the title of the speech is "A Letter to the Rulers of the White House." The wording, the tone that he uses, mimics again another memorable scene from the movie when Muhammad sent letters to the emperor of Byzantium or the emperor of Persia or the ruler of Egypt. Uh, again, I think they're doing this deliberately. I would also want to touch upon Shia extremism because it's very important when we talk about this situation that we have of extremism in the Middle East, we cannot separate the two. We have Sunni extremism and we have Shia extremism and they, they are now feeding into each other into, in, in this cycle. And it's a loop. Uh, it doesn't help anyone to try to determine who began, began first. But what we have is this situation. Uh, and one extremism has gotten to the point of justifying its, its raison d'etre, its why it's around, because of the extremism of the other. So on the Shia extremism, uh, of course, Shias, their whole, their whole, uh, their whole premise is, is, is historical and that they have, uh, uh, the family of the Prophet has been wronged in the succession to Muhammad. Um, and they can cite events uh, from 1400 years of history uh, that uh, demonstrate the injustices that the Sunnis have visited upon the house of Muhammad, the family of Muhammad. And once in a while throughout his Shia history, it breaks out into a form of Shia revanchism, Shia revenge against the Sunnis, to take revenge for the family of the Prophet. Now, in recent years, I believe a new phenomenon of Shia extremism has emerged, uh, and I've called it uh, Shia chauvinism. I, so in 2012, when I started picking up on these hints, uh, I wrote an essay, and my damning evidence that I was using for that essay is a picture that I found online. The picture depicts then Prime Minister Nur al-Maliki, Prime Minister of Iraq. Uh, it's a ban banner that people are carrying at a religious uh, 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 procession, yes. And it says, support the Mukhtar of our age. And here they're referencing a historical character called al-Mukhtar al-Thaqafi, who uh, is credited with avenging uh, the battle, uh, the per uh, taking revenge against the perpetrators of the Battle of Karbala. He defeated some in battle, he executed some, he assassinated some, all right? So uh, uh, he's, he's, again, this poster child of Shia revanchism, Shia power. And here we have a banner with Maliki, this slogan, support, the Mukhtar of our age, so Maliki is now this avenger against the Sunnis. And next to him, we have the Iranian actor who portrayed Al Mukhtar in a TV series that was produced in 2010. Uh, again, an epic production, uh, very well done, uh, 40 episodes, dubbed in Arabic and Urdu in lots of languages. Somebody put up a lot of money for it. And I'm, you know, I'm proud of myself here in this essay. Oh, look, they've gone so far. Right? 2013, Maliki has embraced the appellation of Mukhtar of our age. There are songs being commissioned uh, uh, about Maliki being the Mukhtar. In 2014, in the elections, they consciously use it, purposely use that uh, term in order to, uh, uh, to get support during their election 
uh, during the election season. So uh, that's Shia, uh, Shia extremism, again, mimicking how they borrow from history, how history is elastic, how they use precedent uh, in order to uh, instruct policy, what to do. Just going back to Shia chauvinism, if, if I wasn't clear, so there is, there is a strategy behind that, uh, and I believe it's considered seriously in Tehran. It's not the only strategy that they are considering, uh, but it is, it is kept in play, and it foresees the end result is, is the partition of the Middle East where the Shiites break off into cantons, and they can't live anymore with these Sunnis in, in nation states. There's just too much history, too much bad blood there, and they need to break away and let the Sunnis do their thing. So that's the strategy, strategy behind this kind of extremism. So what, what does that give them when they're, when they're citing history? It gives them this aura of certitude, this aura of certitude that we are going back to something that works. And the problem there is that because they have that aura, it's going to be a lot more difficult to convince them that they've lost or that, that they're losing. Because they can, again, cite history to explain away setbacks. Um, they can explain conspiracy. They can say things like, you know what? We missed a key ingredient in that recipe. We'll go back and try again. And we'll keep trying until we get it right, because this is the recipe book. It's right there. The text is right there telling us what to do in order to resurrect glory and empire. And that terrain, that terrain that they stand so firmly upon, they go unchallenged there for the most part. And I believe they can be challenged on that terrain. So this is, this is the point where we shift to the second part of our talk. What can be done about this? So first question, can it be done? How long will it take? And who goes about doing it? A few months ago, uh, in January 2016, there was something called the Marrakesh Declaration. So Mar Marrakesh is, is in Morocco. Uh, a number of, I believe, 300 Islamic scholars gathered. And the big thing that they did was they reaffirmed the Charter of Medina. What is the Charter of Medina? Charter of Medina is this uh, code uh, or uh, um, this text the, through which Muhammad codified his relationship with minorities, principally the Jews in this case. And the well-meaning, moderate uh, Islamic scholars in Marrakesh were saying that the Islamic State has gone too far against the Christians and the other minorities, and we are reaffirming that charter because that's, that's the legitimate Islam. That's, that's uh, 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 the correct Islam, and that's what we need to go back to. The problem is they're challenging their you know, moderate uh, Muslims versus extremist Muslims, and they're challenging each other on the terrain of, of history. Um, and then they start nitpicking amongst themselves about the interpretation of this Charter of Medina. Are you reading it right? The, and the jihadists are enabled or empowered by saying things like, look, we're re reading it literally. This is exactly what it says. It doesn't, you know, we're not prevaricating, saying, oh, it fit that time of, of Medina, or, we, you know, we need to tone it down a little bit. We're following it to the letter. Uh, Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, the retired uh, Archbishop of Washington, was very happy about this Marrakesh Declaration, and he said something, uh, this is a quote, this declaration can change the whole face of Islam. And he walks it back a bit and says, not change it, but bring it back to where it was. I have a problem with where it was. Because where it was is that solid ground, is that solid terrain that the extremists have used as a springboard to more bolder, more ambitious, audacious ventures. And I ask myself, why take this charter of Medina at face value. Sure, let's have moderate Muslims 
have this argument, this deliberation about interpretation. But there's another thing we can do. There is no Charter of Medina as the actual Charter of Medina, as a, as a document that is displayed uh, behind a glass case in some museum. That never, never survived, even if it was written down. Right? What we know about the Charter of Medina was chronicled 150 to 200 years after the event by Muslim chroniclers. So we don't have the actual evidence of the Charter. We don't have a piece of paper. And when what, what reports we have about that charter arrived to us 150 to 200 years after it was allegedly drawn up. So this gap, this lag of time, allowed a certain discipline of history, historiography, to study how Islamic history was, was written, or the history of early Islam was chronicled after that lag of time. And we have 200 years of hard work done for the most part by Western scholars who used the, 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 the methods of uh, historiography to study these documents, to study these texts that the jihadists are using. And because of that gap, they have to assume that there are uh, lapses that there might be fabrications in there. Uh, a human error might have forgotten something, or somebody who knew a particular detail was killed off in some battle early on in, in Islamic history. Or others had tried to insert certain things into the historical record. So when it comes to the Charter of Medina, 200 years of debate and discourse amongst these scholars, Western scholars, you know, some people say it's believe it to be authentic, it's a unitary document. Some people say, no, look at it, it's clearly a number of different documents that have been amalgamated into one document. Some people point out archaic language, uh, ambiguous terms, um, and you know, of course, scholars and debates amongst them and nitpicking here and there. Uh, um, they get to this point where, after you read this whole corpus of 200 years, of, of work on this particular document, they get, you know, we just won't know for certain. We just know, won't know for certain. That's the nature, that's the lament and angst of a lot of historians who, who deal with that far back. Now, measure up this uncertainty, this angst, versus the certainty of the extremists when they cite history. There has to be a way that we use that fog, fog of doubt, that angst, to cast a shadow on the certainty and clarity of the extremist message. Remember the Pact of Umar mm -hmm. that uh, Abu Umar uh, al-Baghdadi had uh, annulled? Uh, you know, scholarly thinking on this or writing on this leans to say, that this is a forgery. Right? This, this could not have been either authored by, by the second caliph Umar, uh, or uh, um, um, it's clearly not a document that came up during his time. Again, 200 years of hard work by lots of scholars uh, picking this, th these, these texts apart to get to the. Not only that, in 1995, we have a book that was uh, published in Cairo uh, by an Egyptian historian about, it, it's an easy to read book in Arabic, 60 pages, about the Pact of Omar, and he uses the arguments of these scholars, the Orientalists, the Western Orientalists, and he expands it using uh, methods of studying or qualifying uh, reports from early Islam, uh, native uh, methods of uh, qualifying these, the authenticity of these reports. He comes and says, concludes in Arabic, that this is a forgery. I asked myself, back in 2007 when Abu Umar dramatically annuls the Pact of Umar, the original Umar, why didn't somebody come out and brandish this 95 book and say, wait a minute, there's a problem. There's a problem here. You're probably annulling mm -hmm. a forged document. Suddenly, you know, suddenly that the, the wannabe caliph looks foolish or has to spend a lot of time arguing. 
making the case. The flag, the flag of ISIS, with that seal of the Prophet on it, that looks so nice and authentic and archaic, if they've taken that seal from a particular letter uh, attributed to Muhammad with that seal on it, then that letter is a forgery. And again, scholars can determine, carbon dating can determine that it's a forgery. Now, if the jihadists have an actual flag from the time of Muhammad that was Muhammad's flag, which we can do carbon dating on and we can authenticate, that's great, but they don't. All, right? All they have is this flag and they're claiming that this is the flag that uh, the armies of early Islam fought under and conquered, that's likely a forgery. Ibn Saba, the Jew who invented Shiism, he's a fabrication. He's a fabrication by Sunni polemicists, uh, medieval Sunni polemicists, who inserted or created this character out of thin air and inserted him all over the historical record to make the case. The letters to the emperors of the Middle East, that again, how come we don't have references or, or chronicles from the, from the court of the Byzantines or the Sasanian court or the court of the ruler of Egypt that says, oh, we received this letter from a new faith that is declaring itself to the world, all right? We don't have contemporary sources uh, that, that, that uh, uh, tell us that we've received this letter or something big is coming up on the horizon. Remember the figure of Al-Mukhtar, that Maliki, is fashioning himself after. Well, al Muhtar is a very problematic figure in Shia history. Uh, the survival of the Battle of Karbala, uh, the fourth Imam of Shiism, considered uh, Muhtar to be a braggart, to be uh, a liar, uh, to have his own agenda. Um, and this is all stuff we can find in, in the Shia history books. Uh, and again, we can cite and put a dent in whoever is using the image, imagery of Muhtar to propel a new political discourse, extremist political discourse. So, uh, we can, if, if the jihadists have weaponized history, we can counter by weaponizing historiography. And really, all the hard work has been done, and it continues to be done. Great scholarly works are being produced in 2016 that study uh, Islamic history. But the problem is, very little of that is available in the languages of the target audience of the extremists, for example, in Arabic. So we have great scholarship, a great tool that we can use to put a dent in that extremist narrative, but the mechanism of getting it translated and having it propagated and having it popularized on the other end, towards the audiences of the Middle East, we don't, we don't, we don't yet have that uh, ability. So I'm going to finish just by talking about this target audience. I mean, we're we're trying to do polemical judo with extremists. We're, we're trying to use their strength, that solid ground that they stand on. We want to turn it against them, but why? Our, our image of this, uh, of uh, an ISIS or an Islamic State recruit is uh, somebody who lives a, a life of uh, smoking dope, being in and out of prison, riddled with tattoos, all right, and sees fighters with Kalashnikovs uh, in a video and says, oh, that's cool, I want to be part of it. Sure, there are these kinds of recruits, but there's a different kind of recruit who's not just an angry young man. It's an angry young man with a master's degree. And this, this is why this strain of jihadism worries me more. It's, it's not just nihilistic. They're not just tearing down the old order. They're not just slashing out. They seek to build something new. And of course, they legitimize what they're doing by citing precedent, but they have a vision. They're projecting a vision. They're saying, we're following a blueprint that will take us back to redemption to greatness, to empire. And there is, to do that, in order to, to, to get that really moving, they need an infrastructure of talent. They need to draw people who will become the doctors, the engineers, uh, the IT specialists, the media specialists of this new imperial venture. Financiers, you name it. 
these people would be the mid-level management of the jihadist venture. Um, and it, again, there's another problematic aspect, which is once you have this big pool of talent, then you can kill off a lot of people from the, from the very top through drone strikes, through uh, all sorts of uh, other uh, targeted assassinations. But once they have that pool and they have that pipeline of talent from middle management, then they can replenish their, their leadership quite quickly. And that's, that's dangerous. That's also different from <coughs> previous forms of, or previous or jihadist organizations that we have seen. So I believe that this kind of audience, this kind of talent, needs a more cerebral approach uh, and a more cerebral intervention in how they think about uh, uh, or how they digest the extremist message. Um, uh, you know, we need, we need to get in there with, a, with something, with, uh, with uh, a way of engendering critical thought. And if the jihadists are using history and this person is being influenced by that argument of history, then we can insert some doubt into this person's thinking, have them feel that they're being manipulated by propaganda, by people who are stretching history in a certain way. And we need to get this person to hesitate from taking that snap decision of going off and joining the Islamic State or another form of extremism. Uh, so that's, that's who we're after. And that's why we should employ historiography as a weapon to, to beat these extremists. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, questions? As relates specifically to history. Yeah, as, 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 as it relates to, to the kind of the subject you're talking about, things that relate to the Quran that are important. You know, as well before the life of Musa, but that's not when maybe in the ninth century. Dome of the Rock. Yes, Dome of the Rock. Uh, uh, the inscriptions there, but as chronicles of history. We're really talking about people like uh, Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Hisham, and this is happening uh, uh, 150 to 200 years. The, the actual hard work of jotting down what, uh, for the most part, was an oral uh, uh, stories about early Islam that were transferred orally from one generation to the next. There might be some evidence that some of this was written, written up earlier. We have references to snippets here and there, nothing of, of, uh, of, of, of the size of a big history of early Islam or comprehensive, uh, but again, very, almost nothing of that has survived in that gap period uh, or has reached us in the modern age as a manuscript or something that we can point to and say, oh, this is the first time it's been written. I, I don't know if when they picked Abu Bakr as his name, because he's Abu Dua, his, his, uh, he, he was known uh, uh, back in the day when he was uh, not the caliph as Abu Dua. So I don't know why they picked Abu Bakr as his name when they announced him or proclaimed him uh, as a successor in 2010 uh, uh, to, the, to Abu Umar. Uh, uh, it might have been something to that. Uh, but again, it could be that you know, 
Abu Bakr is a hated figure in Shiism, and you know this is just sort of uh, poking the eye of Shiism like that. Now, when it comes to the uh, Ridda Wars and what Abu Bakr did, uh, they cite a lot of this material. They cite a lot of this material to justify waging war specifically against these ideological cousins, other Salafists, other jihadist groups uh, uh, that should have pledged allegiance to the Islamic State, at least in, in, in their view, but uh, prevaricated, rejected, started fighting the Islamic State. So they do, do draw upon uh, uh, these, uh, these sites of source, uh, this kind of sourcing. Interestingly, the narratives coming out from places like Saudi Arabia in denouncing the Islamic State also go back to, to this kind of language, to this kind of uh, um, appellation, Murtaddin or Khawarij, all these things. So this is all, you know, the, the first six years of Islam are still in, in wide currency from every side, from the jihadists themselves like Abu Bakr and from, the en from his enemies. Uh, and they're still... They're still using the, the same slanders, or what they consider to be slanderous, uh, appellations at each other. Did that? Sorry. It's, it's a big topic. It's a big topic, and uh, if, if you want to specify, or if you Okay, so before we get to the external enemy, there are many grades of the internal enemy. So the internal enemy, the Shiites are an internal enemy, that's very clear. But to answer your question specifically, so back in 2006, when they proclaimed the Islamic State, I maintain that they were defeated back then, not because of the surge or the tribal councils, the awakening councils. They were defeated because these other Salafists, uh, these other ideological cousins, felt that this was too much, and this has to be nipped in the bud. And of course, the jihadists, uh, uh, the heirs of Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, who went on, on to declare the Islamic State in Iraq at the time, they felt that because we've leapt forward, because we've taken jihad to the next step, then everybody else should uh, fall in line and pledge allegiance to us. So that, that initial fight, that initial schism, and the bloodletting that happened between them and other organizations like the Islamic Army of Iraq, Jaish uh, al-Mujahideen, Ansar, uh, Ansar al-Islam, these kinds of groups, that bloodletting actually weakened all of these uh, factions and provided the room, the vacuum, uh, for something like the surge and the tribal councils to fill and and hold territory. So they're very mindful that uh, they're going to get pushback from these ideological cousins uh, and they're going to fight them. And again, they would cite these kinds of uh, schisms that occurred in early Islam, not just uh, the Murtaddin, but uh, all sorts of uh, civil wars that broke out in early Islam to say that we have to do this uh, at, uh, because this is a necessary step towards towards what came later, which are the big Islamic conquests. If, if I might say, it uh, it appears that people who create doubt in the Islamic world can get into a lot of trouble. Uh, just uh, take a figure like the uh, noble, notable Egyptian scholar. Nasser Abu Zaid, uh, Zaid uh, mm -hmm. Nasser Abu Zaid. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> and simply examining uh, linguistic influences on the Quran, under which is a reopening of the question that it was perhaps created and hasn't existed co eternally with Allah, uh, earned him the label of apostate. His wife was ordered by an Egyptian court to divorce him, and so they left to the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. In other words, th 
this, it, it seems that the premise uh, for the success of your approach is that you would need a population that would accept the, the criterion you're trying to apply. Mm -hmm. And there seem to be many examples of when someone has tried that, uh, it, it hasn't so much as created doubt as excluded them. Mm -hmm. So how would, so that I'm just raising, I'm creating some, some doubt for myself. Well, the approach that uh, um, I'm suggesting is far more cowardly than what uh, Nasser Abu Zaid has done. Uh, so the room that I see uh, for, for doing this is uh, you're not going after the Quran, you're not going after the early companions, so you're not passing judgment. You're actually passing judgment on the people who came down and started writing this history, the chroniclers, 150 to 200 years after the events took place. So you're, you're asking the question is a very normal question. Is, can you remember what, what, what happened last Tuesday, uh, personally? Um, and then you ask, uh, well, can you recollect what happened on a Tuesday 150 years ago? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the area of, of doubt where we're at. We're not casting doubt on the faith, on the personalities. We're just casting doubt on the people, the natural mistakes that can happen, the agendas that can be at play 150 to 200 years after the events, the chroniclers of that history. And pointing out there are inconsistencies, there are inaccuracies, there are problems with, with uh, uh, contradictions within, within that text. Just pointing that, and actually there is, there is a tradition in Islam, a rich tradition that uh, uh, that plays that out, that fleshes that out, uh, these questions of that, this argumentation over the authenticity of these texts. And that's why we have all these sects that have uh, emerged out of Islam that spread out over time and space. But it's just a follow-up question. Don't you think that the introduction of this methodology of historical criticism would immediately be seen as applicable to the sacred texts which themselves aren't extant for considerable periods of time. I mean, if you can say this about the Pact of Omar, the next thing you'll be doing is saying it about the Quran. Well, it depends. So it, depends it depends how you house this effort. Right. So. Perhaps you could talk about that for a moment. So let's say that we do end up translating some of these scholarly works. And we translate what works strategically, specifically uh, uh, geared towards uh, the, 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 the kind of history that the extremists are citing. I'll give an example. So in the Shia form of extremism, they are saying that we need to go and fight in Syria to defend the shrines, the Shia shrines in Syria. It's a very nice book that uh, came out, I think, in 2014 uh, about uh, the Shia shrines in Syria by uh, Stephanie uh, Mulder. And she makes the case, by and by, that these shrines throughout time, for the most part, had Sunni benefactors. So there you have an example whereby you take this, this, uh, this nice little piece of evidence and you lob it at the people who are saying that we can't live with these Sunnis, we need to fight these Sunnis and we need to protect the shrines and in, in, in the process support the, the Assad regime and keep it in power. So I would, I would get this book translated and that would be part of a systemized effort. And I put this book, uh, get the, the whole copyright and licensing uh, uh, done and I put it online and I'd open up space for people to to again access a lot of scholarly work uh, produced over 200 years and keep it a democratic process discussion boards where people can translate snippets parts of it and make a case it's on them whoever does that it's on them 
to decide if they want to touch something like the Quran. And it's on people who feel that this is going too far or this is uh, sacrilegious to make the case why it is, but allow a discussion to happen. And in the internet, and I believe the, you, you see a lot of this, uh, uh, especially with, with the advent of the Islamic State, you see a lot of people, young people in the Middle East asking this question, is this, is this really our religion? And they're curious. They want to know more. And there's a lot of content uh, on, online that is uncritical of Islamic history. And what I would propose is we'd bring in some content that is critical, make it available in the languages spoken in the Middle East, and allow people to do what they may with, the, with that kind of methodology to, to, uh, to touch upon more delicate topics. It becomes a democratic, a personal decision if you want to dial up the controversy or dial it down. But there has to be a forum, a place, a platform where people can, can be allowed to do this and find like-minded people. And also, because it's democratic, you need to let, allow the other side, both the radicals and the moderates, to come and argue. See, with this target audience, I don't think we're going to win a lot of people, uh, win over a lot of people. Why I think this is useful and timely, as we are uh, uh, in a process of war, is it's, you know, this is not a, scho a scholarly approach. This is a propagandist approach. We need to put a dent into what the other side, the enemy, is using. And if we don't convince a lot of people with this uh, sober, rational approach to reading history, we at least prolong the conversation. We increase the noise. And maybe that helps that person hesitate from taking that snap decision of joining one of these ideologies or these extremist uh, groups. Sorry. Um, I'm curious hmm. to your opinion. You said that this body of scholarly work for the last several hundred years is not accessible or not taking into the Arabic language people. I'm curious as to your thoughts on why that is, the reasons for that. Is it the environment in the region or the historians? Obviously, they studied the documents in the Arabic region. Why do you think that is? There are many reasons. Uh, so why, uh, what, what are the reasons that this big body of work, scholarly work, is not uh, available in the languages uh, of the Middle East? Why there wasn't a curiosity to look into these works and get them translated uh, and have them discussed in the Middle East? Variety of reasons. This is a very good and complex question that I will try to answer bits and parts of. Actually, there's, there's a, a controversy that starts in the West before it even gets to the Middle East, which is this, this line of work, this line of inquiry, this, this uh, uh, endeavor to study Islam was cast in Western universities as some form of conspiracy. Mm -hmm. uh, a famous book by Edward Said, Orientalism, 70s, just painted painted this whole, this whole body of work with, with, with uh, suspicion that it was in the service of uh, uh, colonial powers. Um, and you know, that, that's, how, that's how the problem begins. Now, you can make the case and demonstrate that, sure, there, are, there were examples where this was the case, where Edward Said could, could question the motivation of some of these scholars. But for the most part, no, this is, this is honest scholarly work, curious people, by eccentrics. I mean, to, to go to that length of learning these languages of the Middle East and uh, uh, delving into these difficult texts and archaic uh, uh, wordings, uh, but, but that requires an accent, that requires, really requires somebody who, who wants to know, who's, who's, who's propelled and compelled with, with a desire to learn. And we can make this case, and in, in the last decade or so, there, we are aided by books written in English uh, that make the case that a lot of these scholars were acting in good faith. And of course, they were written 
to counter the last 30 years of maligning this, this line of thought. Of course, in the Middle East, moderates, uh, moderate Islamists and even extremist Islamists understand that this is a threat, understand that, that this opens the door to all sorts of questions, that this kind of methodology, uh, and they're not going to be, uh, they're not going to be enthusiastic about that. Uh, where you've seen some of it emerge. So, so just visualize this. Uh, the, Amer uh, the, the Western leftist elites felt that this field is, uh, is um, suspect. And at the same time, uh, Islamists feel that this field or this methodology is suspect. So in that kind of environment, Who's going to fund this? Who's going to uh, allow it to be taught at universities? Who's going to uh, uh, um, allow it to have traction? What's different now is that we have the internet, where a lot of these, of these conversations can occur, where if you provide the material, you get the copyright and licensing and have it available uh, online, then you might find people who volunteer to do translations or bits of parts of it uh, of these works and provide them to their peers. Good. Sorry. I'd like to follow up on the complexity of that last question. Uh, it seems to me that the, the universe of Salafist thought is, is, uh, or fundamentalist thought is much larger uh, demographically than jihadist, uh, violent jihadist thought. And as has been pointed out, the, there will be, a, by you and, and the questioners, there will be a tendency to, uh, of the fundamentalists, the non, the moderates, the so-called moderates, the Marrakesh uh, crowd, uh, to, uh, to actually defend their point of view, their fundamentalist or, or non-jihadist or traditional Islamic view, uh, which may indeed, without any once it's out there on the net, uh, without any control, start recruiting people into the jihadist of, of, of violent track. That is to say, once attacked, the, the hackles of the entire universe of people with this fundamentalist point of view will be up, and they will be ready to ally themselves or, or consider aligning themselves with the extremists, the violent. So there would be a conservative backlash yes. against somebody going to this. You know, that they, they, the, the, this, this, this definitely might happen. However, you know, we have this problem of extremism without this being uh, an impetus. And we have to also consider that if left unchallenged, this area, if left unchallenged, and heaven forbid that one of these extremists does actually start winning, starts you know, uh, um, saying, well, you know, we told you so. So, you know, the Islamic State of Iraq, why it's important to understand that it's a 10 year venture, because they can say in 2008 and 2009, we were left for dead in Iraq, we were smashed because of this infighting with other Salafist groups, because of the surge, because of the tribal, they were gone. People had forgotten about them. And then, in 2013 and 14, we see them coming back, taking Mosul, taking Raqqa, scaring and frightening the world, uh, getting a coalition of 60 countries to come and do war with them. So they can make the argument that uh, we followed this precedent, we followed history, uh, we kept the faith, and we came back from the dead. Uh, that's a successor. And we might be beaten back. It's natural to have a few setbacks, to lose towns, to lose territory, because we have the whole world coming at us. Uh, we have Iran and the Assad regime and the Saudis, everybody's coming at us and fighting us, sure. But if it's left unchallenged, they can always come back and say, we told you so. And we have a, a bigger danger of people within that wider Salafist universe saying, 
I think, I think these guys have a point here. It turns out they were right about, about forming conditions. We, ju we shouldn't just wait around and uh, wait for the conditions to become ripe in order to launch this big endeavor. All right? These guys are right. That's a bigger danger than a conservative backlash. Uh, there's a, there's a, I, I, I did point out. Sorry. Are there any clues about the first hundred and fifty years in the oral tradition of poetry or metaphor or adages, and can that even can that genre even be used today back again in uh, as a weapon? I know this is a big big C a big topic that actually I'm not qualified to 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 draw upon. Uh, but there's, uh, for example, I'll give you an example. A friend of mine has been working on a secret book for the last 20 years, 25 years, and he has found evidence of what uh, reached us from pre-Islamic poetry uh, of the, the scriptural language within that poetry, encoded within that poetry. That sounds a lot like what Muhammad used early on in the Meccan period. And he was going to, his thesis was going to be that it wasn't anything new that Muhammad came, came up with, that what he was using was familiar to his audience. So there are things like that that can be done, that kind of scholarly work that can be done. My friend has yet to publish his book, so. All right. Thank you very much.